see everybody in here this morning. I tell you, boy, it's been a good week driving up and down County Road 23. Whoever's been praying for the Lord to smooth the rough paths, thank you. And, and Pronsi, just want to say thank you very much to your wife for raising up enough of a fuss to get that road paid for us. So, absolutely. So, so no. <laughs> I'm sure we'll go out there and mess it up somehow. Oh, uh, well, hey, we're looking forward to that. Hey, for the time being, though, it's nice and smooth, and, uh, and we certainly enjoy that. So, but uh, I tell you what, it's been a, uh, it's been a good week. Uh, we're thankful the weather went around us. Um, definitely be praying for the folks that the, uh, that the storms impacted. We have been in a direct strike before, and uh, we know what, it, uh, what it's like. And um, uh, definitely be praying for the, uh, the folks in Louisiana and Texas and the surrounding areas that, um, that went through all of that. Uh, a couple of announcements this morning. I uh, just want to remind, we're doing the bottle water drive from now until September 13th, uh, collecting cases of water to go out to the schools. And um, if you would, when you bring in your water, just put a little note of encouragement, tape it on there or something, just to encourage our, our teachers and our administration. Um, we're still collecting for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, this will be the, uh, the last Sunday we're collecting for school supplies. And um, it, it's almost time for shoe boxes anyways. We'll still take it if you bring it, that's right. So Walmart and them places, they still have uh, school supplies on sale. So uh, if you want to bring those in, absolutely, we'll put those in the shoe boxes. Uh, shoe boxes are actually due November 15th. So it's, uh, it's already sneaking up on, I think, tomorrow is September. No, Tuesday. Tuesday, it's coming up on us fast. So it's, uh, you know, I mean, five months ago, this, this whole thing started. And uh, so it feels like it's been, what, 16 years or so since this pandemic started? But, uh, but we'll, uh, you know, we're still going to make sure we continue to take, folk, take care of folks. And um, so, again, Operation Christmas Child will continue to collect for that. Um, also notice in your bulletin, uh, we've got revival scheduled. Uh, very excited about that. September 13th through the 16th, Brother Tommy Franks will be here. And uh, so we are definitely looking forward to doing revival services. Um, I know a number of other churches in the area have already been doing their revival services and um, Lord's been moving, so we're, we're excited to be, um, be having ours here. I wanted to share with you guys something this morning as we prepare for worship and um, just the awe that it is to come into the presence of God. I turn to Isaiah chapter 6, and, and we find Isaiah's vision of the Lord, and it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I mean, just the, the hem, the, the, the bottom garments of the robe of God filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, and each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. I am so thankful that our sin has been atoned for by the King of kings and by the Lord of lords. And this morning, we can worship our God who is so great and who is so mighty that the, the train of His robe fills the temple and then it shakes. And the angels declare that He is holy and that the earth is full of His glory. May we enter into worship this morning in reverence and awe of the God of the universe who also loves us so much that while we were still enemies, He would send His Son to die for us, to atone for that sin so that we could be in right relationship with Him and that we could properly worship Him. So I encourage you guys this morning, as we come into worship, let us worship Him with all that we have, recognizing the awe and glory and majesty of our God. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, You are great and mighty powerful. Holy is your name. 
And I pray that this morning as we sing songs of worship to you, and as we worship through the receiving of your word, that we would take seriously who you are and how great you are, and that we would respond in kind. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've done here in this community. I thank you for what you are going to do. And Lord, we love you, and we trust you, and we worship you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, if you will, turn to 66 in the hymnal. Let's sing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Oh 
see you in the Lord's house. I hope you've had a great day already. I know I was certainly encouraged from our Sunday school class this morning. Uh, if you're not in Sunday school, I encourage you. We've got several classes. Uh, as the attendance begins to pick back up, we're obviously going to open up more. So I encourage you to be praying about how you can plug in and uh, fit in as we try to resume some type of normalcy again. Before I pray, I want to start out with the title of what we're going to talk about today, and it's Faith Over Fear. And I want you to think about what fear is. And I know you may say, I fear nothing. Well, I, I might disagree with you because we all have something that we don't like. I was sharing with uh, Brother Tab that when I was opening the door on my north end of my shop yesterday afternoon, I was wearing my shorts, and I felt something rubbing on my leg, and I said, oh, it's my cat. Some of y'all that watch me on Sunday night and Wednesday night know Mopsy, the spiritual cat, comes around and gives me the amens and tries to hop up there and disrupt what I'm trying to do. So it was her, and I didn't even look down. Then I went to look for something over here, and I felt her rubbing on my leg again, and, 
And then finally I looked down to pet her, and it was a brown spider about that big around. And y'all may have heard that noise of me hollering, slapping that spider off my leg. When you think about fear, though, we fall into one of three categories. We either have fear of failure, fear of rejection, or fear of loss. That means we're going to fail at what we're trying, or we think we're going to fail. We think we're going to be rejected for trying to do what we are trying to do, or we feel like we're going to have to give up something that we think we must have to make us happy. What do you fear this morning? I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer before we look at God's Word. And let's just lay that fear aside. God, it's my prayer this morning, Lord, that we are fearful of something. We're either fearful, Lord, of failure and trying to do what it is that you've been calling us to do. Father, we've already defeated ourselves in our own mind, Lord. And we just say, why even bother? God, it may be that we're fearing rejection. God, that we don't want to go out to the, to the world to try to share the gospel because we feel like we're going to be rejected or converted or mocked or persecuted or whatever, Lord. We have fear. God, it may be that we fear this morning that we're going to be pulled out of our comfort zone. That thing that we feel like we must have to make us happy, Lord. I must be comfortable. I must be at peace. I must be at rest. God, what do you want for us this morning? It's my prayer, Lord, that you give us strength to stand. Father, that you give us the humbleness to allow you to speak. And that, God, you give us the clarity to be able to hear what it is that you want us to hear this morning. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 18 with me this morning. 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 16. And before we get there, I want to try to give you a little bit of background about why we're talking about faith over fear. 1 Kings chapter 18 is in the life and times of King Ahab. One of my favorite sermons that I like to hear was Brother R.G. Lee preaching on Payday Someday about how Ahab had a man killed, a man named Naboth, to take his vineyard, and about how the circle of life came all the way back around, that that death came back to Ahab and to his wife Jezebel. Ahab was the king of Israel during the time that this passage was written. He was the son of Omri, O-M-R-I. Now, King Ahab was very specific in how he was spoken of in the Bible. 1 Kings 16.30 said, he did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. As bad as some of the kings were, ain't never been one like King Ahab. He married a woman whose name was Jezebel. She was the daughter of a king of Zidonia whose name was Ethbaal, E-T-H-B-A-A-L, which literally meant living with Baal, who was a false god. Her name, Jezebel, J-E-Z-E-B-E-L is translated seeking Baal. So you had a king whose name was living with Baal who had a daughter whose name was seeking Baal and he married, she married the king of Israel. And it was forbidden for the children of Israel to intermarry with the pagans that were around them. And for a king it was even worse because with great responsibility comes great responsibility. To whom much is given, much is required, I believe the Lord said. This marriage, though, was a military alliance. What King Ahab had done in his wickedness was he chose military strength over Almighty God's might. Ahab was so sinful that God sent Elijah the Tishbite. When Ahab got his kingdom set up, brought in Jezebel, he made her a grove, which was a temple to Baal, which was open worship of a false god. Here comes Elijah the Tishbite in to try to talk to Ahab. And 1 Kings 16.33 said, He did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Not only was he more wicked than all of them that come before him, but he made God madder than anyone had ever been before him. 
So here comes Elijah the Tishbite in King, 1 Kings 17, 1, and he says, No dew or rain until God says. Now you just imagine if, if a prophet came in here in Mount Hope, Alabama, and said there will be no rain in Alabama until God says. We were talking to Sunday school this morning. It seems like the hay's going to get another cutting before the end of the year. I mean, it's just growing like crazy. But y'all remember the years we had droughts, that it was so bad that if you had a flat tire, it would spark and set the side of the road on fire. Or if you spun your tires accidentally or on purpose. Could you imagine the, no, no rain? They weren't very happy with Elijah. Elijah had to go into hiding. And Jezebel, the wife of the king, in her infinite wisdom, she set out to kill all the prophets of God in an attempt to break the hold of the drought on the nation. In her mind, she thought, if I kill all these people that are prophesying against us, then we'll have rain. And then 1 Kings chapter 18, after three years and many days, that God told Elijah to go and present himself to Ahab so the suffering of the people would end. So it's three years and however many days pass that. Some folks say it's about three and a half years. I just know it's three years and some days. God tells Elijah, it's time. you got to go present yourself to Ahab. And all this time, Ahab and Jezebel have put a price on Elijah's head. You find him, you kill him. You bring him to me, I'll kill him. You find him, you better let me know, or I'll kill you if you let him slip through your hands. That's how hated Elijah was. Even though the leader of the nation of Israel was sinful, God still pitied the people. And we've got to tell ourselves, remind ourselves, that even though in suffering, God still has a plan. Always has a plan to relieve the righteous. Now there's a man mentioned in this passage of Scripture that we're going to read about today, and his name is Obadiah. Now there are 13 Obadiahs that are mentioned in the Bible. There's even a book in the Old Testament named Obadiah, and nobody can really nail it down that any of these Obadiahs are the same. There's some speculations and there's some theories. But this man Obadiah has to come to grip with having faith versus fear. So here we are, we're in 1 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 7. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and he fell on his face, and he said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? And he answered, and he said, I am. Go tell thy Lord with a little L, behold, Elijah is here. And he, being Obadiah, said, What have I sinned that thou would deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom where the my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said, He is not there, he took an oath with the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he will slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord with a capital L from my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, you, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. How to let faith win out over fear. Now you got to put yourself in Obadiah's shoes. He knows that Ahab is burning, seething with vengeance for Elijah because he believes Elijah has cursed the land. He's not quite got it yet that there's an almighty God that spoke to Elijah and said, you go tell him 
I'm not going to let him have any rain or any dew or anything until I get ready. He's had roughshod run of this whole ordeal long enough. I'm tired of it. I've never been more angry at anybody than I have been at this person. Obadiah knows this, and he runs into Elijah, and he says, Please tell me that it's not you. I can just imagine him saying that. Because now that I've seen you, there's going to be a bounty on my head. I am in danger for being near you. Can you imagine the fear just welling up in him? What am I going to do? Elijah says, You go back and you tell Ahab, that I'm here and he needs to come meet me. And he says, yeah, and while I'm gone, you'll disappear. And Ahab will say, you had him in your hands and you let him escape. He will kill me. I've done all these great and awesome things and I fear the Lord, but I fear Ahab even more than I fear God. That's what he's basically saying. Have we ever been there? You know, I, I'm scared to death of this and I'm scared to death and I'm scared of God. But you know what? This is right here in my face right now. And this is the biggest fear that I have. I'm afraid I'm going to be rejected. I'm afraid I'm going to lose something. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to do it like I think I need to be able to do it. The first thing we have to do is just what Obadiah did, is discern closely. Now, Obadiah knew it was Elijah when he met him, but he could not believe his eyes. He just could not believe what he was seeing. Is it really you? Was he looking to encounter a wanted prophet of God the day he set out from his house? How many of us leave our homes in the morning thinking it's just going to be a lily white rose ride to wherever it is we're going and we're not expecting what God is about to place out in front of us? Man, I never knew the day would turn out like this. I climbed up in an ambulance after I had helped get a lady out of a car. There was a bad wreck, and I helped extricate this woman. And I got up in the ambulance to pray with her, and she said, You know, you're dressed pretty nice for an EMT. I was wearing my black slacks and a polo and had my little spiffy dress shoes on. I said, Ma'am, I'm not an EMT. I'm a preacher, and I'm on the way to be an engineer. But God had a little sidetrack for me. That next Sunday, a little girl in the church we passed her ran up and she said, Brother Jonathan, that was my teacher you prayed for in that ambulance. How would Obadiah know that he was perform, would be to perform God's work that day? He's just going through life, looking for nourishment, the basic needs of life. Verse 5 says that as, as Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all the fountains of water, unto all the brooks, Pre-adventure we find grass to save the horses and mules alive that we lose not all of the beasts. They were at the point of death. And he was just trying to find something to live on. He was on task so much that he almost have missed meeting Elijah. You ever heard the saying, you can't see the nose on the front of your face? You've got to cross your eyes to see it. It's right there all the time, yet we never see it. God has put opportunities right in front of us. Do we have times where we're so goal-oriented that we lose focus of what God is calling us to do? We can't see it, yet it's as plain as the nose on our face. We have to ask ourselves, who's calling the shots in our life? We got to see the football team at Tharptown play Thursday night. And I, I noticed those guys out there, one of them had the, they got the thing on their arm so they know what play to run and got somebody calling the shots, the quarterback telling, but even sometimes the quarterback has to lean back so he can see what the coach is telling him to do. Who's calling the shots in our life? Who are we listening to in this life? Who is it that's a driving force or what is it behind how we live? And can we discern those spirits? Is that you, Elijah? Do my eyes deceive me? There are three spirits that we have to contend with in this world. There's demonic spirits, godly spirits, and human spirits. Which one is it? John said this in 1 John chapter 4. 
He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out in the world. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of the Antichrist. Wherever you've heard that it should come, and even now already it is in this world. Who's calling the shots? When we hear that little voice, is it the demonic spirit? Is it the flesh talking? Or is it God speaking to us? Can we really believe our eyes? Who are we listening to? Who are what's driving us along? Number two thing that we need to have to let faith win out over fear is to listen carefully. We have to discern closely to know what we're hearing. And then we have to listen very carefully. Obadiah had a job. Verse 3 starts out telling about how he was the governor of the king's house. He was a very high-ranking official. He saw firsthand how wicked Ahab was. He knew all too well how sinful and intense Queen Jezebel was. Go find water. Don't go find the prophet. Don't go find God. Don't go get sidetracked. Ahab said, go find me water. You know, if he wasn't successful as a high-ranking official in finding sustenance for their beasts, he could have been killed. He could have been replaced. Who knows what could have been done to him. There was no room for error at this point of desperation. Guys, farmers, y'all just imagine three years and some odd days with no rain, no dew. Brooks have all dried up. The cisterns have all gone dry. I mean, how are they even taking their medicine in the morning? I mean, it's done got to that point. Yet Obadiah had a calling. Verse 3, it says, Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Could you imagine Obadiah living as being governor over the king's house, seeing all this rampant adultery going on? Just imagine how it gnawed at him, not just the fact that they had no water because of what the king was doing, the fact that all the prophets were being killed, he didn't know his best efforts was to try to save them all. Just imagine him having to live with that, yet he feared God greatly. You ever been stuck between a rock and a hard place? Verse 13, he said he hid a hundred prophets from Jezebel. Obadiah wasn't looking for God to call him today. He thought he'd already filled his quota of good deeds for his life. Why else would God allow this drought to also affect him? I'm sure Obadiah had times in his life when he said, God, when you were afflicting the, the, those that had the children of Israel in bondage, when Moses would go into Pharaoh and he would say, let my people go, and you would bring a plague, it affected the Egyptians, but it didn't affect the Israelites. This time, it's affecting the Israelites. This time, I'm suffering for what my king is doing. You're not giving me water and holding it back from him. Yea, he feared God. But at some point, he had to say, why am I suffering too? And that made him fear. Fear that when he told Ahab that God would call Elijah elsewhere. If I go and tell him I found you and I come back and I can't find you, what's that going to do to me? Fear that he would be killed for not killing Elijah there on sight. You had him in your hands and you let him slip away. Fear combined with desperation. I imagine this was just driving him to the edge of insanity. You ever have that point? The, the pressure of the decision that you have to make is just too great to bear. What is it that we're being told to do? What is it that we need to be listening to? I've been hearing a noise in my old tractor. And I've got earmuffs on and singing songs at the top of my lungs as I'm mowing, but I, I can hear something. 
and I'm trying to figure out, what is it? I got my earmuff off on one side. I'm trying not to ruin my hearing in that ear, but I got to hear what this noise is. What am I listening to? Misty's car now and then just makes this erroneous little clattering noise. It has nothing to do with anything other than to annoy me because this car is making the noise. And I'm trying to figure out what that noise is. It may be that somebody here today is being told something and we can't quite tell what it is. How does your instruction, whatever it is you're hearing being told to do, how does that line up with the Word of God? Not what does your heart tell you to do, not what does your friends tell you to do, what does the Word of God tell you to do compared to what you're being told to do. That's how you discern those spirits. How does your instruction impact the kingdom of God? What I'm about to do, is it going to grow the kingdom of God or is it going to hurt the kingdom of God? So many times we want to just flash out, type out, and whatever out, and that does not impact the kingdom of God favorably. How does fear play into our decisions? Have you ever thought about the fact that we have individual personalized fears? Man, we personalize them just the way we like them. Man, we custom tailor those fears to fit our darkest concerns. We dream up with an imagination that only we can conjure what we are to be afraid of. Do we let those fears stand in the way of hearing God? Isaiah in chapter 41, 13 says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. If you've ever had a small kid, you know all too well when you get out of the car in the parking lot, you grab that hand. We got Lydia trained so much that to this day, 17 years old, she'll grab somebody by the hand so I don't get run over, so I don't get lost, not her. Just imagine, God has got you by the right hand and He's leading you. Why should we be afraid? Lastly, we need to obey completely. We've got to discern those spirits and try them to what the Word of God says. We've got to listen carefully so we know exactly what we're being told. And then lastly, we have to obey. Not partially. That's disobedience. Obey completely, fully. Now here we are back in this story. Obadiah standing there with Elijah. And Elijah is telling him, you need to go tell King Ahab to come and meet me. I'm ready to have that face to face. I cannot imagine that he did not consider the cost at that moment. I mean, that's the first thing you do when you look at doing something is, what's this going to cost me? So here's Obadiah, and I'm sure in the back of his mind he said, am I going to disappoint God? Or am I going to go back and face King Ahab and probably die? Am I going to have to face an angry God? Or am I going to have to face Ahab and Jezebel? You ever been there? I've got a decision to make. Who do I want to answer to least? Ignore the obvious and pretend all is well. Is it just human nature to consider the consequences? I don't want to fail. I've got pride. I've got dignity. I've got a name. I've got a reputation. I've got to fill in the blank. I don't want to fail. What conclusion we reach defines how we listen, and how we discern the spirits. How good are our ears? How good is our discernment? Obadiah obeyed God's command. It took some convincing from Elijah. In verse 15, he finally says to him, Surely today I will show myself. Elijah said, I will not betray you in this matter. You ever had to hear that? I've never failed you before. What makes you think I'm going to fail you today? All those times that you walked through those valleys of the shadow of death and I was there with you, what makes you think you're going to face this one by yourself today? You ever been betrayed? It leaves a bad taste in your mouth, don't it? It taints all your future dealings. It makes you that much more suspicious of people. It spreads a cancer over your thoughts and your actions. Unless you forgive and give it to God. Just imagine, 
when Obadiah walked back to King Ahab. And he went in there, and he told him, he said, O king, great king Ahab, I have found Elijah. You did what? I found Elijah. And he said to meet him, you didn't kill him? Down in verse 17, Ahab, when he does meet him, he says, Art thou the troubler of Israel? Ahab still didn't get it. He didn't understand the drought was all his fault. Still blaming Elijah for it because Ahab was blinded by his sin. You ever heard the term free will? That means that we have the ability within ourselves to do what's right or not. I sometimes wish that I didn't have that. I wish it was just gung-ho straight ahead right exactly the way I need to go had those blinders on I can't see nothing but the footprints of God right in front of me just leading me right off into the sunset you know it almost seems unfair to God for us to be allowed to disobey him but I know that conscious obedience is priceless meaning I'm going to do what God calls me to do I'm going to say what God calls me to say. I'm going to walk where God calls me to walk, and I'm going to do it without fear because that's priceless because I chose to do that. I was sharing with a brother just the other day about free will, and he said, you know, if you demanded that your wife love you, you never really would know if she loved you truly or not. You have to give her that free will to love you, and that's the same way God wants us to be with Him. If we love Him truly, we'll obey Him. In fact, in John 14, 15, Jesus said to those listening, He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What did God command us? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then He meant to say, love your neighbor as I have loved you. What is it that God's commanding us to do? It may be that we're fearful. We've got to carry masks in our pocket. We've got to use hand sanitizer. We've got to sit six foot apart. We were in Sunday school this morning, and we're like, don't hold your arms out. We're closer than six foot apart, or closer than we need to be. Can't get out and go in the grocery store anymore because you've got to go in one door and out the same door. They're counting how many people go in and counting how many people come out. I'm scared to pull over and talk to this person. They may cough on me. They may sneeze on me. They may not like what I have to say to them. God may be telling me to share my testimony with somebody, and I'm afraid they may reject that. You know, my favorite analogy about living life is fishing. You can have the best boat. You can have the finest fishing rod. You can have the best bait that money can buy. But if you don't ever put it on that hook and throw it in the water, guess what? Unless you're going up the river where there's Asian carp going to jump in your boat, you ain't going to catch nothing. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid I might lose that hook. I'm afraid I might waste that bait. I'm afraid that the fish may pull my pole out of my hand. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? Are we going to let fear rule us? Or are we going to let faith that God's got this? We may be suffering because of something going on around us, but God's never failed me before. What makes us think He's going to fail us now? I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to ask Brother Jeff and Miss Beth to come on up. And I'm going to ask you to face whatever fear it is that you have right now. What is it that so worries us that we're letting it hold us back? How much longer are you going to hide from it? Father, it's my prayer that we let faith win out over fear today. 
And God, we stop running from whatever it is that's been holding us back. Lord, I'm afraid I may fail. God, I'm afraid I may be rejected. God, I'm afraid I may have to give up something. Lord, I'm going to ask that you just speak to every one of us here today. Give us the courage to lay this fear down and lay it aside. I'm going to ask you to just stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you want to come down to the altar and pray, you come on down. If you need somebody to pray with you, you come on down. You do whatever God is laying on your heart right now, please. Discern that spirit. Listen to what God is calling you to do and obey what He's asking you to do. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next week. Don't wait till whenever you get around to it. Let's commit to do it now. While they play, you pray. You honestly ask God, search me, God. Am I where you want me to be? doing what you want me to do. Please don't walk out those doors today.